Okay, so this morning, um, for those of you who are, are, are visiting, which is quite a few of you, um, we've been working our, our way through the book of John. I've been doing a series on the book of John. I'm probably going to be in the book of John late into the fall. Um, so today we're going to be continuing my series of messages in the book of John. And, and uh, yeah, it, it, last week I ended um, in a, a, a two-part mini-series in John chapter 7, and the setting was Jesus was at the Feast of Tabernacles, the largest feast before the Passover where Jesus was crucified, the largest feast, and, the, and he was teaching in the temple courts, and, uh, you know, he was asking the people that were there, he was calling out to them and saying, are you thirsty? Come and drink of the living water. And Jesus was, was essentially saying that he had living water to give people. He was, he was really stating indirectly that he was the Messiah, the Son of God. And, and uh, so on the last day of this feast, he was, he was calling out to the people. And, and the Jewish religious leaders that were there uh, didn't think that Jesus fit the bill for being the Messiah. So they wanted to shut him down, and they, they tried to have him arrested. And, and so they asked the temple guards to go and arrest Jesus, and, and they refused, actually, because they had never heard anyone teaching like Jesus taught. And you know, that's the, that's the same today as it was thousands of years ago. When you hear the voice of Jesus, it stirs you. It stirs you. And you know, kids, you've got a Bible at home, right? You know, the Bible has the Word of God in it, right? It is the Word of God. The whole Bible is the Word of God. And within the Word of God, when Jesus walked on the earth, He, he spoke to us. And some of Jesus' words are recorded in the Word of God. Do you guys know, does anyone know which books of the Bible have the literal words of Jesus when he was walking on the earth? What do they call those books? You guys know what they call them? The Gospels, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Okay, so that's Jesus' word is truth, and Jesus' word is power. The, G, the Jewish religious, religious leaders wanted Jesus arrested, but God had other plans. So this feast ends. Now, just to get your mind into what was happening, okay, during the Feast of Tabernacles, literally thousands of people were on the Temple Mount worshiping God in the temple. And when Jesus was teaching, he was teaching to these thousands of people. So this is where we, uh, we ended off. The, the Feast came to an end. The eight days of the Feast of Tabernacles came to an end. And everybody went back to their homes. Because all the people had come from different places to gather to worship God on the Feast of Tabernacles, and everybody went home. So, however, we read, and this is where we start off today, in John chapter 8, verses 1 and 2, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. Now, the Mount of Olives, for those of you who don't know Jerusalem, that's where the Garden of Gethsemane is, where Jesus prayed before he was crucified. And when you're, going to, when you're in the Garden of uh, Gethsemane, on the Mount of Olives, and you're looking, you can see Jerusalem, and you can see the Temple Mount from, from higher up on the hill. You can see the Temple Mount. And Jesus would often go to this place to pray. Now, he didn't leave and go back to Nazareth. He didn't leave and go anywhere else because he had plans. He knew that, that he needed to be at the Temple Mount the next day. So at dawn, he woke up, he appeared again in the temple courts, and the people gathered around him, and he, and sat, and he sat down to teach them. Now, the, the Gospel of John here doesn't say how many people gathered around him, but it was a sizable group of people, I'm sure. A crowd of people, you might say, gathered around him to listen, to hear what he had to say. And this was much to the dismay of the Pharisees who uh, wanted people to stay away from Jesus. They didn't want Jesus in the temple teaching. 
like the temple guards who refused to arrest Jesus the day before, these people wanted to hear what Jesus had to say because his words were life and they had never heard anyone speaking like Jesus was speaking. See, there are thirsty people there. Spiritually thirsty people. We live in a barren, dry desert of a world that has no spiritual water. The only water that is there to quench the spiritual thirst of humanity comes from Jesus. So these people sensed that when he said that I have living water for you, if you come and drink, I'll give you living water, they had a sense that he had more to say about this subject, and they were very interested. Needless to say, not everybody that was there was spiritually thirsty. Some of the people that were there, the religious leaders and, and Pharisees were there because they were thirsty, all right, but they were thirsty for other things. They were thirsty for the accolades of man. They were thirsty to keep their power over the people, to have their positions and to be respected as they walked around in their, in their fine clothing and robes and people would bow to them and give them the, the best seats at the banquets and, and people would honor them. They, they were thirsty for the acc accolades of man. They were not thirsty for God. So here is the scenario. So they wanted to take Jesus out. They wanted to take him out of the temple courts. They wanted to humiliate him. They wanted to shame him. They wanted him to mess up. So they decided amongst themselves to present the scenario to Jesus where it would be a catch-22. You guys know what a catch-22 is? It's a scenario where no matter what you do, it's going to look bad on you. So the Pharisees, they planned for this scenario and we read, starting in verse 3 from chapter 8, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman who was caught in adultery. For kids, you guys might not know what that is. Well, it's when a married, married people, one person goes and sleeps with another person that's not their spouse, okay? That's not their husband or wife. That's, that's committing adultery, Okay? So the teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. Now the law of Moses commanded us to stone such a woman, such women. Now what do you say? So as a point of interest, you guys might not know this, one of the powers of the ancient Jewish Sanhedrin, or what the Sanhedrin means, actually the ruling council of the religious uh, system of, over the people, and in Israel they were powerful, one of, their, one of their duties that they saw themselves fit into was to bring capital punishment on offenders for violating certain laws written within the Old Testament. They could not act outside of the spectrum of Roman authority because Israel at that time was, was occupied by Rome. But uh, they held a great deal of sway. And oftentimes the Romans, understanding how much sway that this Sanhedrin or this ruling council had over the people, they would give in to giving them what they asked for to keep civil peace. That makes sense? They're kind of like the, uh, the ones that were the go-betweens between the Jewish people and the Romans. So they, 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 they tried to keep civil order. Now, okay, in our modern culture, you guys know it, our culture is steeped in sexual immorality, isn't it? It's everywhere. You can't escape it. It's just all over the place. Sexual activity and extramarital affairs in our culture has relatively few consequences. But things were different in ancient Israel. The ancient Jewish laws concerning the act of adultery were quite severe. Not just quite severe, they were extremely severe. In fact, the Pharisees who brought this case before Jesus, they brought this woman to Jesus, 
were correct in stating that the act of adultery as written in the law of Moses was a capital punishment offense. So if you, if you were married and you slept with someone else's spouse or someone else while you're married, the law of Moses actually says that you are to be killed, that you are to have capital punishment. And here's what it says. The Pharisees were correct in stating the law of Moses said this. Deuteronomy chapter 22, 22 uh, is written in the law of Moses. If a man is found sleeping with another man's wife, both the man who slept with her and the woman must die. You must purge the evil from Israel. Leviticus chapter 20, verse 10 also says, If a man commits adultery with another man's wife, with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress are to be put to death. That's a foreign thing in our culture, isn't it? But it was very, very, very serious. Well, okay, so this is the case that was brought before Jesus. Very, very serious case and brought in public view. Why wouldn't the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin try this case in privacy if they were going to try it? Why did they publicly humiliate this woman the way that they did and parade her around in the temple courts? You see, these people, these Pharisees, were not interested in justice, really. They, they, They were looking for an excuse to try and destroy the reputation of Jesus Christ. And we continue reading in verse 6 of our text, which says, they were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. It's kind of bizarre, isn't it? This very serious capital case comes in front of crowds of people in the Temple Mount. And Jesus simply hears them out. And he bends down and he begins to scribe something in the dirt. You see, the catch-22, like the scenario where it was bad for Jesus if he said one thing, or if he said the opposite thing, was this. If Jesus said that the woman should not be killed or stoned to death, they would accuse him of teaching in violation of Moses' law. However, if he urged them to execute her, he would appear brutal to the people and they could make him out to be a troublemaker in front of the Roman authorities. So no matter what he did, they were trying to make him look bad. According to Rabbi Eri Enkin, rabbinic director of United with Israel, this is, I'm going to read a comment from him. In the workings of the ancient Sanhedrin, which was the Jewish religious court, if they wanted the death penalty for a certain offense, certain criteria needed to be met. The witnesses to a capital crime had to be observant adult Jewish men who were learned in Jewish tradition. Witnesses of any other type would not be admitted to testify in a capital punishment offense. So too, there had to be at least two witnesses to the transgression who could see each other at the time of the sin. Witnesses could not be related to each other or the accused. What's more, for someone to be deemed worthy of the death penalty, they had to commit the sin after having been warned by the witnesses. If any of these requirements were not met, a person could not be sentenced to death. So for them to have brought this woman to Jesus in the temple... All of these conditions must have been met. However, there's a problem with the circumstance. I don't know if it jumped out at you when you read it, but when I read it, I saw a problem with this here. Now, if you read the law of Moses in the Scripture, the first question that enters my mind is, where is the dude? Where is the man in all of this? Why is it that they took a woman by herself To face this, where's the man? If she was caught in adultery in the act, why was only one offender brought before the Lord? (laughs) The answer is obvious. It's not stated, but they must have had provision for the man to escape. 
which means that this event was likely staged to set up something to bring to make Jesus look bad. How devious. Assuming all this took place in the line with the religious tradition of the day, the witnesses to this offense would have been present while they were bringing this case to Jesus. The Pharisees were eager to publicly humiliate this woman because they could have tried this case in privacy. But they could have also brought the man to trial, which they didn't. They purposely confronted the scenario in full sight of all the people in the temple. All the hundreds, maybe even thousands, a thousand people. I don't know how many people were there. We don't know. It doesn't, it doesn't say. But there was a, probably a good number of people there. They brought it there. And in verse 6, in our text, we see Jesus. What does he do? They just presented this very complex, troublesome, heart-wrenching case before him. Does he engage with the, scenar- with the, with the scenario? Does he, does he shout at the Pharisees because he sees that they're trying to frame him and they're trying to make him look bad? No. Does he yell at the woman and condemn her like, yeah, you're right, you know, like, no. No. As soon as he heard the scenario, what does he do? He stoops down and begins writing in the dirt. You know, and I've read this story before, and I kind of wondered, why did he write in the dirt? Like, why would he stoop down? It's not exactly, we're not exactly sure of all the reasons, but, because it's not spoken, but I would suggest that Jesus was just basically calling time out here. I'm sure this woman was probably like, oh, you know? Can you imagine her facing the crowds and people that she was related to and and all that was taking place there? She would have been just broken. Broken. Jesus stoops down. He's not, ah! He stoops down. And he begins writing. But I, I would suggest to you that he writes not just for no reason. The, the reason he did this was significant. Did you know that there's three occasions in the Bible outside of this where God actually wrote into the earth? You guys know what they were? The first were, were both on the same subject. The first time God put his finger into the earth and wrote was when he wrote the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai and gave the Ten Commandments to Moses. And the first set of Ten Commandments, by the way, number seven of the Ten Commandments is thou shalt not commit adultery. God wrote into the rock and gave Moses the Ten Commandments. He went down and saw the people who were worshiping other gods while he was gone. And he smashed them in in frustration. And then he went and God gave him another set of commandments, the same thing, wrote and again. So there's two. And you know what the third one is? You guys know the book of Daniel? Who's read the book of Daniel here? You guys read the book of Daniel? Okay. Well, in Daniel's time, there was a Babylonian king named Belshazzar. And Belshazzar was a, an arrogant, godless man. Well, I shouldn't say godless. He worshipped other gods. He didn't worship the God of heaven. He didn't worship the God of Israel, the one who created the heavens and the earth. He worshipped other gods. And he was not respectful of the Lord God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. As a matter of fact, he was having a party, a drinking party, where they were all getting drunk, and he took the temple... Uh, cups, the things that were used in worship of the Lord that had been taken from the Solomon's temple in Jerusalem when Israel went captive, he took those things and offered them to pe- for people to drink and get drunk out of. He was mocking God. He was not respecting the fact that the Lord, He is God and there is no other. He mocked them. Well, what would happen? All of a sudden, during the middle of this drinking party, here's King Belshazzar, and all of a sudden this big hand comes up and starts to write. 
Mene, Mene, Tekel, and Parson into the wall, into the earthen wall. And what he said was, You, O Belshazzar, have been weighed in the scales of justice and have been found wanting. As such, your kingdom will be taken away from you and will be given to the Medes and the Persians. That's essentially what this meant. So you can see Jesus is writing in the dirt. Consider Jesus. He had just finished calling out the crowds the day prior. In John 7, 37 and 38, I'm going to repeat it just for your, for your information so you can kind of see where I'm coming from. On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow within them. See, the, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they didn't want to hear the words of Jesus saying that he was the source of all spiritual life. He was the source of the living water of God that comes from the Holy Spirit. Rather than listening to what he had to say, they ordered the temple guards to arrest the Lord. And the temple guards couldn't do it. They refused. So here we see the Pharisees hardening, their, their hearts were even hardened further they're taking a step further and they're trying to trap Jesus, presenting him with this scenario with malintention. They didn't care about the woman. They didn't care about anyone. All they wanted was what they wanted to raise their profile and to lower Jesus' profile. They were making a mockery of God. As we can see by looking in the Old Testament, both the act of the adulteress and the same sin, the act of the Pharisees and teachers of the law, had been subject to God writing into the earth. So when Jesus bows and stoops and begins to write, he's fulfilling a prophecy. And you guys, probably a lot of you have never heard this prophecy before. But it's in the Bible. In Jeremiah chapter 17, 3, there is a prophecy concerning the coming Messiah. And this is what it says. Lord, you are the hope of Israel. All who forsake you will be put to shame. Those who turn away from you will be written in the dust because they have forsaken the Lord the spring of living water. Isn't that amazing? This is hundreds and hundreds of years before Christ came. What Jesus wrote in the dust that day was not recorded. The exact words of his writing weren't recorded. But whatever he wrote, coupled with what he was going to say next to these Pharisees and teachers of the law, got their attention. Got their attention. Considering the fulfillment of the prophecy in Jeremiah, it's very possible, we don't know what was written, but it's very possible that Jesus stooped. I don't know. It's speculated. We can't say for sure, but maybe he wrote the names of the Pharisees that were there. And maybe corresponding sense, I don't know. But whatever he did made these guys stop. This plan that they had hatched, it it. It stopped it right away. They were refusing to drink the living water. Therefore, they would be written in the dust. Little did they know that the fulfillment signaled that he, that Jesus, was actually the Lord. He was the promised Messiah. And the Pharisees who meant to shame the woman and to forsake Jesus were being put to shame by the very Son of God that they were rejecting. It was as, as if Jesus was saying, I hear what you're saying, but I know your hearts. Do you not understand that I am the one that wrote the law? 
I am. They asked Jesus who he was before and who had sent him. He said that the Father in heaven sent him and that before Abraham was, I am. Jesus, God in the flesh, was there. When, he kept on question, when they kept on questioning him, it says in verse 7, he straightened up and said to them, let any of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. So here he is. They're like presenting, they're expecting this big sparking case where he's going to, they're going to stump him or he's going to say something foolish. And he just stoops down and he begins writing and then he stands up and he goes, whoever here is without sin, casts the first stone. And then he goes back down and he begins writing again. (laughs) Wow. Okay. You know, another prophecy in Isaiah chapter 42, 1 to 5 says this. It says, Here is my servant. This is talking about Isaiah prophesying about the Messiah coming. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight, I will put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break. A smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on the earth. In his teaching... The islands will put their hope. You see the significance of that prophecy? God knew the hearts of all the people that were standing in front of him. He knew their thoughts. He knew who had wicked intentions towards him. And rather than shouting in protest in front of the crowds that he was teaching and shouting at these men at the injustice of what they were trying to do to trap him, he quietly wrote in the dust and calmly spoke the truth in line. He spoke the truth in line with everything that would bring justice to the circumstance at hand. You see, God knew, Jesus knew hearts. God knows, folks, He knows us. Jesus, when He looks at us, He sees our hearts. And when we're sincere, and when we're not, He knew that those Pharisees, they weren't sincere. They're filled with malice and and sin, loaded with sin as well. They're, They're condemning this woman, and they themselves were loaded down with sin. And so the result of what Jesus had to say, it actually caught them to the heart, and they had deep conviction and shame. The oldest ones left first. They were shamed. And then the younger ones followed. See, the older ones understood the depravity of human nature because they've lived the whole life of it. And the younger ones realized it too, but just not quite as deeply as the older ones did. And what about this woman? What about this poor woman who is broken by sin? Broken by her decisions to, to, to disregard the law of God and to shame her family and her husband and to do this this terrible thing. Is there any hope for this woman, this shamed, broken woman? And sadly, this passage in in teaching from Jesus is often used to to almost belittle sin. Sadly, it's like, oh, that woman, God just sort of let her go. So that's okay for me to just do what I want and you let me go too. (laughs) That's not the point. That's not the point. You see, Jesus did not excuse this woman's sin on any, on any level. He didn't say that they should disregard the law of Moses. He didn't say it. What he said was that those without any sin should be the first ones to cast the first stones. In, in fact, what God was actually saying in this circumstance is that those who are guilty of sins and have not been caught are just as guilty as those who are sinners that have been caught. 
And as people, we can often harden our hearts to our own sin, and we can very easily posture towards being hard on others around us who sin. It's easy for us to look out there and see the sin of others than it is to accept the fact that we have a heart problem too. You know, for a moment I'd like you to consider King David. You guys know the story, right? King David and Bathsheba. David's army was off fighting and David was at home in his palace and he's looking out over his balcony or portico or whatever you want to call it and he sees this woman neighboring in a neighboring house somewhere and she's bathing. Oh, his heart was drawn to this woman's beauty. And he's like, he crafted a plan inside of his being. I must have that woman. So being the king, the king gets what he wants usually. He used his power and his influence to go over and have this woman come to his palace and he ended where, wherever. He ended up having an adulterous affair with this woman. But the bad part about it is that David actually knew that this woman was married to another man. David committed a sin that had capital punishment associated to it. He did. And, to make matters worse, he sent the husband of that woman to his death on the front lines in the war that he was having with the Philistines. King David did this. And then as time went on, he kind of left, brushed it aside. But, you see, God understood what had happened, and God was going to bring this to light. In 2 Samuel 12, 1-4, the Lord sent Nathan, the prophet, Nathan to David, When he came to him, he said, There was two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except a little ewe lamb that he had bought. He raised it and grew up with him and his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup, and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. When David was told this story, he was furious. He assumed that this was a true story and that Nathan had brought him a a case where he should draw judgment on it. So what he said is, oh, that's a terrible man. That's basically what he He said, he's a terrible man. He deserves to be taken and put to death for what he did. Nathan points at David and goes, the man is you. (gasps) God put his finger on the inner workings of David's heart. And David immediately was realizing of how great of a sinner he was. And he repented before God right there and then. He repented. See, David cried and he repented, but he still had to face consequences. God didn't take his life, but he still had consequences to face for this. There's a lot of consequences. We don't have time to go into that today. But God never got, let David just skate. He said, David, you need, to, you need to come before me and lay this down. And yeah, I'll restore you, but there's going to be some consequences. Now, in the case of Jesus here with this woman brought for, before him by the Pharisees, we don't know what he wrote in the dirt. We don't. Maybe it had something to do with a woman, too. We know that he didn't condone what she did or what she got involved with. But, friends, the point is this. The Pharisees also had issues. 
I will put it to you this way. Who here has not, not sinned? Anyone? Good. I'm glad that you didn't put your hand up. Because if you did, you're lying. Because you're a sinner. You see, we know intrinsically that we're sinners. No, we may not have committed adultery. Maybe we committed some other sin. But sometimes, I would, I would say this story, it's fair to say that we are in the position of the woman. Eh? Where we've done something wrong and we've been caught in the web of what we've done wrong. And here we are facing consequences. We're dragged and people are calling for our head or for us to be stoned, you know, killed. Or just destroyed, our reputation destroyed, and they're calling for it. And guess what? We deserve to have some form of consequence. Sin deserves consequence. Do you understand this? The penalty of sin, the Bible says, or the wages of sin, is death. Sin always brings terrible consequences. Don't ever think that you can go out and freely sin and do whatever you want without there being some form of consequence. Sin brings with it consequence. And sometimes, like the woman who committed the adultery, we realize, or like David who committed adultery and murder, we realize how terrible of a sinner that we are, and we come to God and we beg Him for mercy. Now, this woman was silent, but you know that she was posturing, oh, if only I would have not done this. God saw her heart and saw the sorrow and the humiliation and the consequences that this sin was bringing on her. But he also saw the Pharisees and how quick they were to judge and to use someone else's bad decisions for their own benefit. And sometimes I would say, not only do we act like a woman, the woman who committed adultery in our sin, it doesn't have to be adultery, it can be anything. But sometimes we take the seat of the judge, like the Pharisee. And we're so apt to, to point the finger and call for someone else's exposure and, and a penalty to be imposed on them, not realizing that there but for the grace of God go I. Oh, my, peop my people, the Lord says, He wants us to humble ourselves before him and understand that he came to set the captive free, to save the soul from sin, and to heal the sick. The Lord has come for these reasons. And all of us here fit into the category of sinners, whether we cast judgment or we ourselves fall into sins of various kinds. And you know what? This shows us the heart of God. How did God respond? Yes, he stood up to the Pharisees and he called them out. At this, who, those who heard, in verse 9 it says, began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until Jesus only, only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. From the eldest to the youngest they left. <laughs> They left with unrepented hearts. They were ashamed and they just needed to get out of the heat. And then there's this woman. And God saw through the exteriors. He knew, knew what this woman's heart is. I suggest that the way Jesus handled this woman, her heart was crying. Her heart was broken. We see with David, when he committed that sin with Bathsheba, what did he write? He wrote in the, first, in the first couple of verses of the 51st Psalm, he cried out, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgression. Wash away my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so you are right in the verdict and justified when you judge. You see, sometimes we don't like consequences for our sins, but we underestimate God's holiness, and we overestimate our own righteousness in such cases. See, David's repentance resulted in him being able to live. 
There's other consequences. His son rose up against him. There's different things that happened. His son died. A whole bunch of stuff happened. We find it so difficult to condemn sin in ourselves. But you know something? If we're harboring things in our heart that aren't right before God, He's not just going to let it go. If you're His child, He's going to correct you. You're going to face God's discipline. God does a lot of uncomfortable things that simply must be done in a world of sin. But the fact is, God never intended for us to be comfortable with sin or the fallout of it, which is the consequences. It should bother us. It should stir us to mourning. You see, mature Christians understand this, but it doesn't make living in a fallen world any easier, does it? It's difficult. You see, God in His sovereignty knows the hearts of people, and He does what is best all the time. That means for the Pharisees, He did what was best in this case. And for the woman that came, he did what was best because he knows her heart. And you know what? God knows what's best for you. And maybe you've done stuff that you haven't received the consequences that you thought you deserved. Well, guess what? Sometimes grace allows God just to take it away. And he just, he knows your heart and he knows what's best and he knows how to, how to put your life together. He knows if discipline in a certain level is going to do good or if it's not or if he should handle it in a different way. He sees the heart. This woman who had just been publicly humiliated, Jesus straightened up and asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said then neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. The truth is that, like the adulteress in this story, not a single one of us when we come to believe in Jesus gets what we genuinely deserve. You know that? This guy standing here and everyone sitting in those seats out there deserve the wrath of God in full measure. In ourselves? In our sins? Romans 6.23, you guys memorized that in Awana maybe, or in Sunday school. Or maybe you've never heard this before, but if you haven't, this is what it says. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. So like this woman who is caught in adultery, or the Pharisees who are self-righteous and condemning of others when they themselves had so many issues to surrender to the Lord, when we stand before Jesus, knowing full well we deserve the wrath of God because of our sin, we desperately need God's mercy. And when we come to the Lord with penitent hearts, in 1 John chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, this is what it says. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and He is just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make Him out to be a liar and His word is not in us. The good news, my friends, here today, and this is where we're going to end. The good news is that Jesus died for the sins of the people in this world. And that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but will have everlasting life. For the Son of God did not come into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. The Savior has come. The Savior has died to set you free from the shackles of your sin. And when you realize that He doesn't give you what you deserve, but He offers you grace, for by grace are you saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. It is God's grace, and God's grace alone that saves you. You are not good enough to make it to heaven on your own. You're not good enough to stand in the presence of the Almighty Holy God on your own. You're not good enough and you never will be because, because you are in sinful flesh. But God demonstrates His love to us in this. That while we were still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. He died for us. He died for you. You can believe in the Lord and you can come to Him like this woman who is broken understanding the depravity that you, you, you followed. And you can cast your anxieties upon Him. And you can call out to Him for mercy. And He will not turn you away. A bruised reed He will not despise. Just like the prophecy said, He loves you people. 
Kids today, if you haven't heard the gospel in this way, we're sinners and we need God's forgiveness. We need His grace. You can come to Him today. Just like that woman who was broken and humble before Him, He said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. God doesn't clean us from the muck of the world and the sin so we can just continue going on in it and doing what we want. He cleanses us. He sets us free so that we can truly live in a life that is pleasing to the Lord. So, in the former things that you've done, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Come to the cross, my friend, and lay down your cares and your burdens. Lay down your, your malice and your anger and your hypocrisy and your adulteries. You know, the Bible says that if we look at a person lustfully in our minds, we have committed adultery. We've committed adultery. We're sinners and we need Him every hour. And the Father provided the Lord Jesus Christ as the Lamb who would take the wrath instead of us. The wrath was put on Jesus instead of on you. Isn't that good news? Amen. And then He cleans us and He gives us a spirit to walk in step with so that we will not lo no longer fulfill the desires of our sin nature. If you've fallen, come to the Lord. He is a very gentle and good God and far patienter than any of us are. Amen. Would the worship team come? We're just going to sing the song in closing, Run to the Father, because really that's what we need to do. We need to run to the Lord today. If you're here and you just need to pray, I would, I would just ask you to come and pray. But we'll end with this song today, and uh, I'm just going to close in prayer before we sing. Lord, we thank you for this day that you have made. We rejoice and are glad in it. We thank you, God, for your word and the power that is resident within it. The lessons that are taught through your word, God, are good. Oh, Lord, forgive us, God, for our sins. Cleanse us, oh, Lord. Help us, oh, God, to stay true to you and to your word. Help us to love you by being obedient to you, Lord, and, and follow you. God, have mercy on us according to your steadfast love. Lord, forgive us for being like the Pharisees sometime and judging others when we have issues in our own hearts that need to be dealt with. God, today, we just take it as a day to ponder your word and to open our hearts and ask that you touch what needs to be touched and take away what needs to be taken away and build what needs to be built. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with us as we close? May God's grace and peace rest on you in abundance. If you want to pray, um, through the doors there is a prayer room. Uh, feel free to, to go and pray. And, and if someone wants prayer, I, I'll pray with you. Or someone else can come and pray. Maybe one of the board members or other people that are, have it on their heart to do that. Amen. May God's grace and peace rest on you in abundance this week.